Hi, everybody. I'm Keith Vitale, and welcome to Psychic Podcast. Now, before we start this episode, let me introduce you to my new producer, Corey Gomez. Hi, Corey. Hey, how's it going tonight? Good, good, good. I'm excited to have you on the team. I'm excited to be working with you. And uh, I'm just thinking we're going to have some great shows ahead. Now, before we get started, uh, let me share with my audience. I normally film uh, my podcast in my office downstairs in the basement, but I thought I'd switch it up a little bit, come up into my living room. And if you guys can take a look at it, my wife and I love the house. And I hope you guys enjoy the view as much as, as we do as well. I got to ask you. How did you get involved? What made you want to start studying martial arts? That's a good question. I was uh, at the university. It was, it was called the College of Charleston in South Carolina. It's in, in Charleston. And I'm on a track scholarship. I'm a distance runner. So I am blessed with strong legs and a strong cardiovascular because I'm running 20 miles a day. In spite of myself, you know, so you know, I am now in, you know, it just have the perfect kind of, body for for any kind of uh, sporting event that you had to use your legs and have good wind. So I came over the summer after my first year running a track and my best friend in high school, AC Floor, was a guy named John Bellinger. So Bellinger was taking Carter with me at the time. And he drove over to my parents' house during the summer. He picked me up. He says, I want you to go to meet somebody. So I got in the car. We went to the University of South Carolina and his instructor was there, John Roper. He's a Korean. Badass, hard ass Korean. No Korean. I don't care who you think about whatever has been tougher than this Korean. This guy was the meanest, hardest dude in the whole world. He never said the word good to me. Good. Never used that word until I got my black belt. That but he was just tough blood and guts. Back in the old days, they considered the white belt the very lowest form of human being. And then as you got each belt, darker color signified more knowledge. And when you got your black belt, now you have knowledge. So anyway, I met, uh, get this, here's how compulsive I was and passionate. So I sat there and I watched a class and I watched a little guy about five foot six, Joe Fracaveri, I'm still good friends with today. He was sparring with a big guy holding his own and he was doing kicks. I'd never seen the kicks before. I loved it. So at the end of the class, John introduces me to Roper. Roper comes to him and he goes, he said, you like martial arts? I said, I've never seen it before to today. I love it. He says, I said, but how does it work? How does a little guy, because he was small, how's a guy like you defeat some big guy like in the movies? He says, because we take our hand and he made a fist, and he rolled it. He says, see my two knuckles? He says, I'm not going to hit you with my whole hand. I'm going to hit you with just this specific area, concentrated area. And then he smacked me in my chest. I broke my bone just doing that one. I went, oh my gosh. He said, that's where we get our power. He says, if you ever want to come and come to the South Carolina, I'd like to have you in class. Guess what I did? I go home. I pick up the phone. I call my track coach, drop my scholarship. I called my dad. I said, dad, I dropped my scholarship. He said, what are you doing? You're insane. I said, no, I'm going to move to, back to Columbia. And he says, well, you're going to have to pay for your own college. I said, I'll do whatever I got to do, but I want to start taking karate. So the next semester, I applied for the University of South Carolina. I got accepted and I walked in in class and within two years, I got my black belt, but I fell in love with it. I was, I was in love. I was just, just infatuated with the kicking portion of it. What made you decide then after you studied martial arts to go into competitive fighting? Well, I really didn't have to say so because you, back then your instructor told you what to do. So my first tournament or two, you know, I'd go just be a local or it wouldn't be a local, but it'd be just a taekwondo is Korean karate, what taekwondo means. It'd be just Korean style karate. And you'd go fight. And then I enjoyed it. I actually went bad at it at the beginning of it um, because I had two things going for me. I can fight all day and not get tired. And usually when you're fighting, you get exhausted very quickly. Well, I've been running 20 miles a day, you know, so I'm in the best shape possible. Plus, I've got more leg, I got more miles on my legs, on my shoes than most people I had on their cars. So talk about strong legs. I had no clue or I didn't didn't know how strong my kicks were because, you know, I was a track runner. But when I learned good technique and Roper was a, he was just technically perfect about the psychic. So he really enforced that we had to have perfect technique. If your technique's off slightly, then you lose all your power. So he worked on technique first. Everything's got to be exact. 
once I was as exact with my sidekick, for example, then I just could execute more power, more speed. And then I was unstoppable because my sidekick was my calling card. The name of my podcast is called The Sidekick. If you ask anybody in the country, what's Vitaly known for when he was a fighter? They go, oh, the sidekick. I can hit you as a sidekick and I can make the rain stop. The sidekick stopped everything. And the reason so is it's a straight technique and it's powerful. The round kicks and the punches, a big guy can just walk through you, but they can't walk through a sidekick if it's done properly. The sidekick can just hit you and crush and break your bones. So that was the key to my success. Now, if um, when you did it, it was more like competitive fighting, kickboxing type style. If UFC would have been around back then, would you have tried ultimate fighting mixed martial arts? I, I have to say yes. I went to an event in Las Vegas just recently, and I watched some of the fighters, and I felt like I could get in the ring now. I mean, I, of course I can't. You know, I'm much older, but in my mind, I'm not. In my mind, I'm still the fighter I was when I was in my youth, and I could still do. I mean, I'd have to learn how to fight on the ground. That's a whole different discipline. But if I could learn the discipline standing up, I'm pretty sure I could learn the discipline fighting on the ground as well. So I, with my speed and my power, I think I would have been, been able to excel in it. You never know, but I would definitely would have given it a shot. I, I'm not a big UFC fan in a lot of ways for just for the simple fact that I love martial arts. I love what martial arts stands for, respect, discipline. There's none of that in UFC. But you know why? Because a lot of the fighters didn't come from the martial arts background. A lot of the fighters came from boxing or judo or jiu-jitsu, or they might have come from a wrestling. They might have a lot of them are great collegiate wrestlers. They're great. You know, and that's great, but they don't have that built-in respect where you come in and you bow and you show respect. That's gone. That's none. If you look at any of the UFC fights, they're talking trash, they're yelling at each other. It's a whole different world. You don't see that. It's not allowed in the martial arts world. In the martial arts world, if you're disrespectful, you're gone. You know, you're in a battle. You're to fight. Win or lose, you show respect to that person. That's what I miss in, you know, UFC. Now, I got a friend of mine, Joe Corley, who's starting trying to do the renaissance with the new PKA, Professional Karate Association. He used to have it years ago. And he's trying to get that, you know, started back up again. I wish him success because if he does... He'll be doing stand-up fighting in his uh, PK. So, and I'd be I'd be interested to see that take off again. Now, I know a lot of people like Don the Dragon, friend of yours. Uh, I've got to meet Don once. Um, you know, martial arts and fighting led him to acting. Cynthia Rothrock was forms, led her to acting. He's just so on and so on. Was it your fighting that led you to being discovered for your first film? Right. And... Um, uh, there's other podcast episodes you'll see out there. I actually, I was uh, doing so well in martial arts that when I became the number one fighter in the country, I went three years in a row being the number one fighter, all weight classes. I made a lot of magazine covers. It was one of those 13 or so magazine covers. It's actually two of them. I was on the two different covers at the same time. And Hollywood's, you know how they are. They're always looking for that new star, that new fresh face. And Priscilla McDonald, she's one of the assistants for Menachem Gold um, Bagan at Canon Films. She went to the drug, went to a bookstore, started going through martial arts magazines looking for a face, and she came upon mine. I went, I want this guy. And then she found a couple of magazines, and that's how it started. So I got really got discovered being on Karate Illustrated and official karate. Now, what was your what was your first? I know uh I myself discovered you uh, my one of my personal favorite movies, Revenge of the Ninja. What was your first film? Was it Revenge of the Ninja or was it with, uh, no, I can't talk, or was it Wheels on Meals, which I never understood why no. it's not called Meals on Wheels, but yeah. You know. Right. And it, I don't even know why. And I remember talking to Jackie Chan and Samuel Hung, and they couldn't tell me either. They go, well, I don't know. They just called it Wheels on Meals. But um, no, it was uh, a movie called Force Five. Now, the movie Force 5, Pat Johnson, who just recently passed away about a year ago, he was the stunt coordinator for the film. And what he did was he was he amassed about 50 of the top fighters around the world to bring him on this one uh, set. So he invited me to come up and I went down there and I auditioned and I didn't do well in my audition. I didn't know what I was doing. And I remember it was Weinstein and it was the same director for um, Bruce Lee's movie. 
uh, entered the dragon. So he was there and I ended, I auditioned for him and he says, oh, he's good. He'll, he could be a good bad guy. So it gave me the opportunity to be in the film. My first fight scene was with Richard Norton. And as I'm fighting Richard, I'm looking around, seeing how everybody's acting. And, and I, I knew I wasn't ready because the director, man, he was a kind of a jerk and he was yelling at, at actors and he was yelling at, you know, extras. And I went, I'm not mentally ready to have somebody yell at me at this time of my life. So I, I felt good that this was a great stage. I was just a, a thug in the movie. I was a bad guy. I got beaten up. I did a couple of scenes and I enjoyed it. It wasn't until Revenge of the Ninja that I got my first starring role. By then, it was a little later and I took some acting classes. I was better prepared for it because I had already been on the set and I knew what to expect. I was really grateful that I had the opportunity to be on, on uh, Force 5, um, but it got me ready for Revenge of the Ninja. And then it hit every theater in the country, then every major theater in the world became one of the top movies, top 10. And it was one of the first movies that MGM Studios picked up. We had premieres. And so it was one of the first films that a studio actually bought the rights to it and then had releases in every theater in the country. So my first film, I have a star role in a film that's in every theater in the country. And then my second film was Wheels on Mills. And so guess who that was? That's back to Pat Johnson again. He calls me up and says, hey, Keith, you did a great job in, in uh, that first movie. I liked your performance in Wheels on Mills. How would you like to, to, be, to do a film and star with Jackie Chan? I said, love it. He goes, can you be there in Spain in two days? I said, I've got my passport. I'm ready to go. He's all right. Here's how much it is. Get on a plane. I'll see you. I'll send you the ticket. And he sent me down there. I remember flying down there. There was another gentleman named Benny Urquidez, who's very famous in martial arts. And him and I went together, flew together. We were the two American bad guys in the film. And it was Benny Urquidez. I'm sorry, it was Jackie Chan. Samuel Hung and Yuan Bao, that were the stars. They were the three stars in a whole series of movies in Hong Kong. They were fun to work, great to work with. Am I the only one that thinks, and not that my opinion really means a lot in this, I always thought Yuan Biao, especially after watching uh, Dragons Forever, would you say, and this is not to degrade any, any of the other ones, Would, in my opinion, I always thought he was the better of the martial artist than Sammo or Jackie. W am I the only person in the world to think that? No, no, it's not so much better or worse or whatever. They're all talented in different ways. Jackie was versatile and, you know, he didn't have the form that like a high, high technician, like a Keith Cook has, or, you know, somebody that's perfect with all their techniques. Lauren Abaddon has beautiful techniques. As you know, Jackie Chan didn't have that. Jackie Chan has excitement. Head movement, arms moving, flailing a whole bit. He's exciting. Samuel Hung was a director. They all starred together in their own films. He was powerful. He was a brute. He could just run. He was. Now, Young Bao was shorter, lighter, and he had the perfect technique. He was speedy. He was, my goodness, he was technically perfect. And all in different ways, they complemented each, each other. I enjoyed because one of my fight scenes I had, my major one was with uh, Young Bao. And Young Bao and I really enjoyed each other's company. We enjoyed fighting each other. And um, I remember that, I remember I got a videotape. It was from someone and it had some of the top movies of all time. My fight scene, the scene where I fought and chased Young Bao around the castle basement down there, dungeon, uh, was considered one of the best fight scenes of all time, but not the best. The best was from that same movie was Benny Akita's fight with Jackie Chan. And I was there for that because we were filming. We filmed every day, everything together. I'd watch Benny, then I'd go film and whatever. But it was the first time I watched a film in raw. Raw means no editing, no sound effects, no G uh, you know green screen, CGI. It was just Benny and Jackie. Samuel Hung's the director, put it together. They're doing five, six moves, cut. But every time they did a technique or a sequence, I went, it's the best I've ever seen. It's That's the best I've ever seen. And I went, oh my gosh, that's, and it got better and better and better. And I was right, because I think if you Google it, it's considered the best of all fight scenes of all time. That's how great that fight scene was. And I was so fortunate to be there to watch it in person. I was a big fan of, of that, but another one that I was, and I don't want to spend a lot of time asking you about it because I'm sure we'll have a whole episode about it. Um, no Retreat, No Surrender 3, 
Blood Brothers with you and Lauren Abaddon. Now, the question I got to get out right of the way is the beginning of the movie, you got, I want to know if this is true. You get shot. So you're in like a cast for the rest of the movie. Uh, the rumor on the Wikipedia and the Google, which I don't take for anything, was that you got hurt practicing a move with Lauren Abaddon and actually broke your hand. And so that's why you were in a cast. Is that true or is that false? No, but it is Lauren's fault. He didn't, I wasn't scoring him. But we, we went to John Prevatt's karate school two days before we started to film. And we just went to work out. And G. Ewing, he's the owner of seasonal films. He wanted to watch his, you know, throw some techniques. So we had already warmed up and demonstrated our techniques. And everything was going great. Right before we left, that damn Lauren Avedon did a, a flying kick I've never seen before. There was a guy holding a hanging bag. And he's, as he's holding it, Lauren just flew up in the air. Now, Lauren is just got fantastic technique. Did a double side kick, like over my head. It hit the top of the bag, then bounced down into a stance. And he looked at me and smiled. And I went, uh, he's not getting the best of me. I'm going to do it myself. Well, guess what? The guy that was holding the bag took off. So I back up. I slide up. And I went up. I just remember I flew in the air. And I'm a jump kicker. I kicked 10 feet in the air because I'm a jumper. I went up and I went, oh, my gosh, I've never done this before, but it's beautiful. I had both sidekicks up in the air, top of the bag, beautiful. The bag swung. I went straight down. I hit the concrete with my wrist and the bone just popped straight out. And I remember looking at it going like that, going, oh, my gosh. They rushed me to the hospital. They wrapped it up. And then they had to make a decision whether to keep me or send me back home. And Keith Strandberg was the writer, producer, best friend I have. And he fought for me. And then Lauren Abaddon, he went to NG and said, no, I want to keep Keith in there. Because NG would have gotten rid of me. He didn't care. He, he's about the money. But instead of getting rid of me, Lauren kind of looked up to me because I had a little bit of fame in the martial arts. And he's such a nice guy. And he said, no, keep Keith in it. So they put a cast on me. And then two days later, I was filming. But I don't know if anybody's ever broken a bone. Two days later, when the bone's popping out, doesn't stop a thing. I was in pain every day for the entire shoot. I mean, excruciating pain. And I've got to do all these fight scenes and flips and jumps. And every time that cast is just touched, I'm I'm really in pain. But guess what? You know, I, I'll i I'll suffer later. But I, I just wanted to get through it, which I did. But, I, but Lauren, I joke about it. I could learn it because you're ass. You're the one, you know, if you hadn't been showing off, I wouldn't have done that damn technique. Now, is it true? And like I said, I, I don't want to ask you 100 questions about each movie because I know they'll be individual. The uh the last fight that you have in the airport hangar, and and forgive me, I cannot remember the main bad guy's name, the albino bad guy you fought. Ryan Hunter. Right. Is it true? Ryan Hunter. Martial arts. No, he doesn't know martial arts. He was a good athlete. He might have been a white belt or green belt, but he you know he couldn't kick or punch or do anything. But it, but he's the kind of person, he was a method actor from Los Angeles. We had Luke Askew in the movie, Joseph Campanella. We have really good actors in this film. So here comes this Ryan Hunter from California. And he's a method actor. By that, I mean, when I was introduced to him, get this, he walks up to me and I go, hi, I'm Keith Vitale. And I reached my hand out to shake his hand. You know what he did? I don't like you. I'm the bad guy. I said, so you're in character already? He goes, yeah, I'm going to stay in character this whole movie. And then he just walked away. I went, what an asshole. He was in character the time I met him. He was in character until the time I left. And, you know, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but some people get in character and that's who they are. So he wanted not to like me or Lauren because that was his. And here's the thing. The Chinese doubled him in about 90 percent, if more. Now, the close ups is him when he does a motion. That's him. And then when any kind of action, you'll see the wig on. It's an old wig. And this Chinese guys with they had the greatest stuntmen in the world with Tony Leung was a stunt coordinator. Tony Leung is the best. And he had a crew, about eight uh, people, stunt guys from Hong Kong, all worked, the same guys that worked on Jackie Chan films and worked with Raymond Chow. And they're the best, best there is. And they all doubled him. They found a guy about the same height and they doubled him. And so here's this guy who's the bad guy who really handles Lauren and I at the end of the fight scene. It takes two of us to fight him. I remember my son saw the fight. You no, know, my son said, Travis, he goes dead. You suck. I go, what do you mean I suck? He goes, he says, you can't even beat up an old white man. He's an old guy with white hair. I went, what do you mean? He goes, it took two of you to beat that guy up and you couldn't even beat him up. I went, oh my gosh, people believe what they see. 
No, it's a film. It's choreographed. But I, I get mad at Keith Strandberg. And I've interviewed Keith Strandberg before for my podcast. And Keith and I are great friends. And I go to Switzerland where he lives. And I spend time with my wife and I. We're just best of friends forever. I complain to him. I go, Keith, why do you put me in a film with Lauren that we get beaten up by, by a by a old by a white guy, old white guy, a guy with, with white hair? He says, you know why? Because you're thinking of yourself. You're not thinking of the movie. I said, of course I'm thinking of myself. I don't care about it. I said, of course, Lauren and I are thinking about ourselves. We're joking about the way. He goes, no, the movie story works better, but this guy is so formidable. You guys can't beat him. But for you guys, each individually, you want to be showcased like a Steven Seagal and showcase your power and whatever. So, yeah, I, you know, Keith is right. I'm wrong. But still, when you look at it, two of us couldn't handle that guy who's not even a martial artist. Well, you know, that's been copied, um, whether people want to admit it or not, like in the movie, uh, and forgive me, I don't know the uh, Utakir, um, I don't know all the names in the movie, The Ray, fantastic martial arts movie. It's a two-on-one fight. The two good guys are battling the the main villain who's beating the crap out of both of them. So it's, it's a formula I've seen done since No Retreat, No Surrender 3. Right. Yeah, and Keith Strindberg, I have to give him a lot of credit because he wrote the one, two, and three, and others, King of the Kickboxer, American Shaolin, all these great movies. And what he did was he brought the Hong Kong style of fighting, martial arts fighting, to this, to American cinema. And NG, Seasonal Films, is solely responsible for bringing that genre here, which now has an effect on 90% of all action films. Now, what do you prefer, like, in the movies, like, you see a movie like let's say Seagal. And I mean, I'm a big guy. I'm a Seagal fan. He hits you, you know, bam, and you're dead. Where you watch a movie now, like <laughs> another person I'm a big fan, right. like say Jason Statham, he's going to come flying at you. He's going to hit you 50, 60 times before you even, like his fight with Vin Diesel in Fast and the Furious 7. You know, it's a 20 minute fight, you know, but if it was Seagal and Vin Diesel, he'd have went, and that was it. Now, would you rather see when you're watching a movie something very realistic, a one punch, or do you want to see a big 20 minute spectacle. Great question. And I think I like both, but I'm more impressed with Seagal, Steven Seagal. He showcases power. People today, if you ask anyone who knows martial arts films, Steven Seagal is the most powerful. What people don't realize, I've choreographed films. I taught with Keith Strandberg and Michael DePasquale and a whole host of instructors. We had a film camp in Storm King, New York, and we taught fighters, would-be actors and stuntmen, how to break into film. And what we had to do was teach them how to stunt fight. Guess what? And when you throw techniques, you actually don't hit. Now, sometimes you hit to the body, but what you're doing is that you're missing. There's air between you. And you're not showcasing the power. It's the person who's reacting to your punch or kick that will determine if you're powerful or not. So when Steven Seagal does this, and he hits the air, and then you respond. If you respond like this, then you, then Steven Seagal has no power. But when they put in a crackling noise where the, he's broke his bones, and the music goes up, but then the guy's laying like, like this, you go, oh, my God, Steven Seagal is the greatest, even though he didn't even make contact. So, yes, I, I like both styles, but I'm more impressed with those sometimes. Now, from an aesthetic, aesthetic standpoint, I like to see the beauty of the technique. So I like to see the Hong Kong films. And I, I love, so I like both genres, but oh my gosh, uh, I always love it when somebody says, he's better than you. And I go, you don't understand. It's not the fighter that determines how good he is. It's the person reacting to that fighter. So when you're doing these camps or when you're auditioning, a lot of times, not just the casting director and the director and producer, the stars will come. You know why? They're looking for somebody to double them. If they can find somebody in the audition that can really sell and be charismatic and you go, oh, my God, I want that guy to fight because when I hit him, he's going to really react in a way. You know, the triple spins they do when you hit him. If you can find a guy like that, that's the guy you want to fight in your fight scene. You know, and so that's wonderful. If you find a guy that's wooden, that doesn't react, well, he takes away from you as the fighter, as the actor. So when you're breaking into films, you have to realize you come in, the best way to break into films really is as a stunt fighter, because you're going to make that fighter look good. Then you're going to get your own break, maybe to have a line or two or be in a film. Now, a question I got for you, and I, I hate to keep mentioning Steven Seagal, but like 
Steven Seagal, we saw him in Above the Law in early 80s. We're 2024. He's still making movies, still pumping out a couple a year. You made a handful of films and then you stopped making movies. Why is it that you didn't just continue to keep going and going? Did you not want to be like one of these guys that's 60 years old and still doing a martial arts film? Well, not really. I, I changed my path. I changed. I was ha I had a young family and and I felt so bad that I was so many times in different locations and not spending the time with my family. Because when you go sometimes, you know, I'm going for two, three months at a time. You know, I'm in South Africa or I'm in Barcelona or I'm in wherever, you know, and I'm gone and I'm not watching my kids grow up. So I made a commitment that I wanted to be there. I've had enough limelight. I've got all the awards that that you should give any human being and a bag of chips. I don't need any more. So I said, I told my wife, I said, I want to settle down, raise my family. And, you know, from time to time, I'll do a cameo here and there. I just like I we saw, spoke earlier, I did a cameo for Battle Creek for Cynthia Rothrock's movie in November. We shot that in Arizona at the Tombstone uh, Studios. And I fought my good friend, old Nim, just my old friend, Ben Yukidis. Same guy I acted with back in the old days with Jackie Chan movie, Wilson Mills. So it was a hundred percent uh, pleasure. And as we move forward with these episodes, we'll do a we'll devote a whole episode for Battle Creek. Now, when it comes to Battle Creek, I, I, I think I'll just tell you this. I might have told you this, but uh, not that anyone's listening for me. But I, I wanted to share this. I have had the biggest crush on Cynthia Rothrock for thirty something years, like <laughs> most of us guys have. So admit it, guys. You know. Right. Yeah. And when I got the pleasure to talk to Richard Norton, I said, Norton. I, said, I always thought you, I said, I watched the China O'Brien one and two. I watched these, uh, you know, uh, God, they did so many movies together and I'm drawing a blank. I said, I watched all these movies with you and I thought you were dating Cynthia Rothrock and I wanted to beat the crap out of you. The only thing that stopped me was, I know you <laughs> killed me. So, uh, yeah, I always thought as a kid, they were romantically linked, but, uh, uh, Cynthia is beautiful. What, uh, I know you, you're going to talk about a future day, but. Did you have a good time doing Battle Creek or crowdfunded film? Oh, here's the thing about Cynthia. That's one of the reasons that she's successful. Granted that she's a great martial artist, probably one of the best of all time, but she's sincerely a wonderful person deep down. She has a wonderful heart. She wants to help others. She's talented. She's beautiful. And she's got one thing that most women don't have on film. She can display power. Some women can throw a technique out, but it does, doesn't look powerful enough. She can really throw dynamic kicks. It's those dynamic kicks that these producers and directors are looking for. And she's wonderful. But how nice it is that you'd be able to say that this person who's successful is also a good person off the set as well. That's wonderful. Now, Richard Norton's been one of my great friends forever. My first fight scene was with him. We've remained friends forever. He'd come back down in the old days, my karate schools I had in the south side of Atlanta, and he'd come down, watch me spar with my, my fighters. And then um, we go out together. And, you know, he's just a wonderful guy. He's so class. He's royalty. Chuck Norris, Cynthia Rothrock. You got Don Wilson. You got Richard Norton. You got Ben Yukitas. They are like they're the king of England royalty. You know, this is the Duke of Winchester. This is, you know, these are the people. And I'm telling you, none of them will disappoint you. They're all wonderful people. And in the nice, now, have you heard the same about Steven Seagal? I don't know him personally. I don't know, but you don't hear the same stories. There's a lot of talk about him being a jerk or hurting people. I was working on a film in Tampa, Florida with Keith Strandberg uh, called uh, Super Fights. No, it was, it was No Tree, No Surrender. And, and we had some of the crew, the, the, the stunt fighters, left the set. They were working with Steven Seagal and came to us and worked on ours. And I said, what happened? He says, he was abusing us, hurting us on set. And I went, wow. So that's, that's the only thing I know. Now, I believe him because I know these guys, but that's the reputation he has. But does he look good on film in the old days? Yes. Does he display power? Yes. So I can see why he became a big star. I really do. I, I enjoyed his movies. He was. A lot of people don't know um, when Warner Brothers was going, when he had just been discovered for Above the Law. I don't know what it would have been like. He was their first choice to play Batman before Michael Keaton. I didn't even know that. 
Now, I know he was connected with Hollywood big time, Paramount Studios, one of the Warner Brothers, one of the studios. And um, so that's how he got his first break. He spoke fluent Chinese and he spent a lot of time, I'm sorry, Ch Japanese, and he spent a lot of time in Japan. So there was that element of, you know, that Asian kind of aura around him. And he was the real deal. He, he was good. I had friends, really good friends. And I said, tell me the truth. You've been to his seminars. Is he any good? And they go, Keith, he's better than you think. He really is the real deal. So in real life, not talking films, in real life, he can do all that stuff. He will break your bones in real life. He's very talented. And I've never heard one person say that he's not talented. So, you know, this, I give him kudos for that. So the guy, is he's a big talent. One of the things I want to ask you here before we wrap up on this, I guess you could call this season two, episode one, because you've been doing the show for a while. Um, it's just kind of changed a little bit. But um, when you're uh, when you watch movies now, uh, do you ever like pick them apart, or do you, uh, or do you just sit back and enjoy them and have fun? Good question. Do you know nobody's ever asked me that question before? My wife does has asked me that, but not not anybody else. And it's difficult because when I watch an action movie. I am writing, I'm watching it from a choreographer's standpoint, a stunt coordinator's standpoint. I'm looking for hits. I'm looking for misses. The obvious misses, you know, when somebody throws a kick a mile away and everybody at home can see he missed, but still the guy reacts. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for facial expressions. Then I need to watch it again and get immersed into the film. And don't worry about that. Then I can just really enjoy it. But both, both times I watch it, I enjoy it. But I have a director's eye, a stunt coordinator's eye when I watch it each film that I do. Now I got one more question for you. You went to uh, Dr. Bob. Uh, it does an anti-aging and you're a, uh, you keep Robert, in really uh, good Robert shape. Goldberg. Robert Gold, Thank you. Yep. You keep in really good shape. Um, what is your, what is your secret? Well, I, I'm not a drinker. I'm going to have a beer once in a while, but very seldom. And I've never smoked and I stay active. Do you know right now, on like tonight, I had to postpone my my tennis match. You know, I still play competitive tennis. The team that I'm on in Atlanta, Georgia, won the states. Then we won the regionals, and the next week we're we're going for the national championships. So I stay just current. I have a gym down in my basement. I'll show you one day. We'll do a podcast down there, and I have everything. I I I when I'm had the house. I I just got one of the rooms in the basement. I have a beautiful gym and I have kicking bags and I have everything, the weights. I have, I even have the uh, basketball shooting machine in there. That's, that's electric. I have Peloton. I have, you name it. I have uh, big screen TV. So I go down there and I relax. Now my wife, Kathy, she's hardcore. She needs somebody to tell her what to do. She needs somebody to motivate her. She needs people to be competing with her. So she can pick up the pace. So she goes to a gym and does hardcore stuff. You know, she's picking up tires and upside down push-ups and running four miles. She comes home and she is a stud. She's an athlete. She's one of my black belts. And Kathy comes home drenching wet. Me, I'm downstairs. I've got the TV on. I've got my bands. I'm doing some light stuff. Then I hit the bag. I'm enjoying life. So I saw the key to success is, if it's so hard, you might not want to do it. So I do things that I enjoy to stay active. I play other sports. I love golf. I love tennis. I'm still competitive. I watch what I eat. I have the worst diet in the world. Nobody has a worse diet than me. I, you, you don't have a five-year-old that has a worse diet than me. I eat no vegetables. I've never eaten vegetables. I don't eat any fish, any seafood. I don't eat anything. I just I love pasta, pizza. I like chicken and hamburgers. How hard is that? And I spent my whole life just eating that. So I have to really stay active and work all the time. Well, I guess with that, I don't want to ask you, you were kind enough to introduce me. Let me kind enough be able to outro you. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, for listening to the show. And I want to thank you for having me on the show. Uh, I hope everybody that listens liked it. I hope everybody that watches likes uh, all the footage and everything that we've shown and you know, the best is yet to come with a lot of movies to talk about, a lot of uh, people to interview, you know, just a lot to cover. That's great. I'm excited about it.